Welcome everyone to a PHR seminar series. It is uh, my pleasure to have so many people here uh, from OBC and also from across the road from Food Science Department uh, for a very special guest, uh, Dr. Steve Boriner. Oh. And I'm sure that he's going to be entertaining us for the next um, 40, 45 minutes or so. Uh, maybe I've seen on Dr. Boriner, but for those of you who don't, uh, he's been a faculty member in the Food Science Department since 2002. And he's currently a full professor at the Department of Food Science, uh, like I said, just across the road from us. Uh, Dr. Warner received his BSc and PhD from the UK in the area of, um, I believe, food microbiology. Was it food microbiology? Oh, yes. I to believe, well, oh, food science, really. Food science. Yeah. And uh, he continued his work at the University of Manchester, and uh, his work was focused on biosensors at this university, and subsequently he returned to University of Nottingham, uh, where he had received his Bachelor of Science in Food Science, and uh, he went back there to become a research fellow in food microbiology. Over the last 15 years uh, that Dr. Warner has been here at the University of Guelph, his research has focused on microbiology and food safety, and he's published many, many publications, 100 papers, book chapters, patents, conference abstracts, and so forth. And his interests are, are focused on enhancing food safety within meat processing and the fresh cut sectors. And uh, his research team has advanced knowledge in the area of emerging pathogens, intervention technologies, and development of biosensor devices for detection of foodborne hazards. And he's frequently contacted by the media. I can attest to the fact that I see <laughs> Dr. Werner on TV more often than I see any other news anchor, uh, <laughs> whoever, you know, that you can identify as some of the key uh, people in uh, the, uh, various news agencies. I see Dr. Werner more often than those people. So he's a very sought after person by media. And uh, Dr. Werner is going to be telling us a little bit more about intervention in poultry processing to enhance uh, safety and shelf. Thank you very much, Keith, for accepting my invitation. Oh, no, thanks, and Sharon. Invitation. Oh, yes, uh, thanks for inviting me. So, um, yeah, for the media, I just don't know how to say no. But uh, what we're going to do today is talk about uh, poultry and uh, interventions to enhance its safety. And I'll be talking a lot about how the regulations have changed and how it's a changing landscape. Now, our sort of main focus in terms of research has always been fresh produce, uh, because fresh produce is the number one cause of outbreaks of foodborne illness. But then, uh, second, the number of cases is actually poultry, in terms of um, Salmonella and Compilobacter, which we'll talk about. So, obviously, in terms of industry size, um, certainly the Canadian industry is very big. We produce 260 million chickens a year. Uh, dwarfs the um, Americans, which produce 7 billion uh, chickens a year. And the fact is we are very reliant on our exports markets uh, in order to sustain the industry, which basically means that we have to follow the American lead for the regulations <coughs> they bring on so we can export to that country. So we'll talk about that and uh, a few other things. So in terms of outlines, I'll talk about foodborne illness and how significant poultry is. I'll be talking about a few key outbreaks uh, which uh, bring home the message. Uh, the source of the pathogens, which I think we all know, isn't it, because uh, you all, most of you are vets and food scientists should know this anyway. Uh, but then we'll be talking about what we can do in terms of interventions. You know, how can we reduce the carriage of pathogens uh, to meet these stringent standards that uh, people demand these days? And I'm finishing off with consumer outreach because as we'll talk about, a lot of the cases we see are down to consumers, i.e. you and me, in terms of not defrosting our chickens enough, not cooking them enough, or just uh, cross-contamination in the kitchen and things like that, all right? So when we talk about pathogens and poultry, we can think about a lot of different pathogens, can't we? Avian influenza, I don't think anyone's caught influenza from handling a, uh, a piece of chicken, um, but Certainly at the farm level, it's significant, as most of you will know, uh, being vets. Uh, Acrobacter is actually a relation to Compilobacter, which is, uh, causes very similar sort of illnesses, which is coming on. Then we come to Clostridium perfringens. 
Now, anyone in the poultry world will know a lot about Clostridium perfringens because it's uh, a fairly significant killer of poultry. In actual fact, though, there's been a few foodborne illness outbreaks linked to Clostridium perfringens, and that's linked to temperature control. If you have temperature abuse, then that can grow and uh, cause illness. Even E. coli, the sugar toxin E. coli, have been linked to poultry as well. There's been a few outbreaks. It's not obviously the main carrier of E. coli, uh, 0157, but there have been cases implicated it. Helicobacter is one that causes stomach ulcers, which uh, you might know about. And Listeria, Staph aureus again, is one linked to temperature abuse, produces a toxin which can't be destroyed, and you consume it, and 30 minutes later, you're ill. But really, when we talk about poultry, we talk about Campylobacter and Salmonella. They're the two main ones. So in terms of uh, source attribution or illnesses uh, which are recorded, the CDC, uh, that's the uh, Central Disease Control in the US, come out with statistics. And they came out with uh, the latest statistics on the number of infections uh, back in uh, last year. And what they find now is that they're including what we call non-culture-based technique results, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, PCR, so molecular methods. So typically what you would have to do is that uh, you do a, a screening technique with PCR to detect salmonella or compilobacter or whichever pathogen, but then you do culture confirmation to get a positive result, and that's what they used to uh, count. But now they're actually uh, counting the non-culture-based techniques. So with this, the, the statistics have really gone up. And I know it's a very small uh, print there, but typically what we're really saying is that most of the foodborne illness outbreaks caused by bacteria are due to Salmonella and uh, Compilobacter. Now, what you will see, um, and uh, people on the webinar won't be able to see this maybe, but um, there's a lot of non-culture recovery and what we call reflux, as in we get a PCR result which is positive, we get a culture negative. <coughs> and there's different reasons for that, but you can see with Compilobacter that's really significant, with Vibrio it's significant. And there's a sort of line of research that's going on in terms of bacterial dormancy, which you'll come to hear a lot about in the future years, but we won't talk about it now. Uh, needless to say though, that uh, certainly in terms of uh, number of illnesses reported in clinical settings, Salmonella and Compilobacter lead the way. Now, why should we be concerned about that? Well, it's all down to money, isn't it, at the end of the day? Well, for the welfare of the population as well, I suspect. Um, and when we look at the dollars and cents in terms of what, how much it costs, you can see here, Compilobacter leads the way. And when we talk about the cost of illness, yes, we talk about the cost of uh, treatment, but we also look at lost productivity. We also look at these secondary symptoms, these chronic conditions that can develop, which are actually more significant than the actual illness themselves. So you'll notice um, on this sort of breakdown, the quality of life, that means you know, how many cumulative years is of the quality of life of the whole population, because when we're ill, that's not what we call good quality of life. It's very significant, uh, so with the cost. And if you look at the top four, poultry is in the top two. So it goes without saying, doesn't it? If you want to save money on healthcare, if you want to save money on productivity, Compilobacter and Salmonella in poultry is the way to go. So I'm pretty sure you all know about Compilobacter. It's uh, a strange organism in that it's very fragile. It needs microaerophilic uh, conditions to grow. Uh, and there, it doesn't grow that well outside the GI tract environment. But it doesn't need to grow because 500 cells is enough to cause illness. And anybody who's suffered from Compilobacter will know the symptoms well. Explosive diarrhea for a week. You don't usually die of it. You wish you could sometimes. But uh, what's more significant is the sort of secondary symptoms. So you might have heard of Gull and Berry syndrome, for example. This is where your own immune system starts attacking your own body and degrading it, you become paralyzed. Arthritis, it's even been linked to Huss syndrome, which you know, you're really linked to uh, sugar toxin E. coli, isn't it? And septicemia. So it's not the initial phase of illness that's really expensive, even though it's, uh, it can be. It's these secondary conditions that can be lethal. And it's multi-drug resistant, as uh, we'll talk about as we go along. So when you look at source attribution, uh, you can say most of the compiler we get um, or consumers suffer from is usually from poultry, undercooking, cross-contamination, and things like that. 
So it goes without saying that if you want to tackle the compiler back to problem, you have to tackle the chicken poultry problem, isn't it? Now, Salmonella is almost the reverse of uh, compiler back to you know, It's very strong. It's very sturdy in the environment. It can grow in the environment. Um, typically, uh, it goes in a cycle where it gets deposited in manure. The manure gets used on land. Uh, the land go it goes into the water system. It goes onto the crops and things like that. And so it just gets widespread. It just like, goes through the circle uh, or, or this cyclic sort of uh, behavior. So very stress tolerant, can survive in the environment for a long time. Multi-drug resistant, again, we'll talk a little bit about that. But it's not just the initial salmonella that's the problem. It's the secondary symptoms, this sensitivity to illness, this anxiety, depression, arthritis, and even neurological disorders. Uh, a poor girl in um, Australia, for example, she caught um, some neurological diseases from um, a KFC. Uh, she got awarded $8 million damages, but KFC successfully defended themselves and she didn't get anything in the end, which was a shame. But it just illustrates the seriousness. So when we look at Salmonella isolated from poultry, everyone talks about Enteritis. Salmonella, Enteritis and poultry go together. But in actual fact, Kentucky is the most significant cerebar. And this has a lot of common features to those top uh, four Salmonellas. Highly virulent and multidrug resistant. And if you look at Kentucky, you'll notice it ravaged Europe. It originated, people suggest, in North Africa, and it's just gone through, every, uh, through the globe, uh, linked primarily to poultry, although other vehicles uh, are implicated as well. Now, the thing with Salmonella, unlike Compiler Back, which is really focusing on poultry, Salmonella, because it's widespread in the environment, gets into all kinds of uh, food systems. So obviously uh, poultry is a chief cause, <coughs> beef is a, a cause, eggs, um, you know, back in the 80s, the salmonella carriage on eggs was really significant. But what we're finding is that salmonella has gone into all kinds of things like seeds, uh, you might have heard about the chia seed recall, it gets into sprouts, it gets on tomatoes, and the big significant uh, sort of vehicle people are looking at now is dry ingredients. Salmonella becomes very tolerant under dry conditions. And even the zoonotic transfer is significant. In zoonotic transfer, uh, there's been a big focus on um, pet food. Uh, now it's under the same sort of regulation as human food. So before it wasn't, but now it is. You know, due to the fact that salmonella can be transmitted to pets, we can transmit it to us, and we all suffer. And the most susceptible group is uh, below five years old, and they're the ones who tend to like kissing turtles. They're the one that uh, likes to handle chicks and things like that. So it's a significant issue. So at the end of the day, though, yes, we do have other vehicles, but meat and eggs are the, the key vehicles for salmonella in both terms of outbreaks and uh, number of cases. All right, so. What we have then is I've got all these cases of salmonella and compiler back, so we have to reduce them because of the cost implication and yeah, because we want to, the population to be well, isn't it? That's what we're here for. And so how do we do it? Well, when we think about what causes um, salmonella and compiler back to in chicken, you know, not many of us eat raw chicken. I know I was just talking to Shai about this restaurant that actually does sell raw chicken if you want raw chicken tartar. Uh, I wouldn't advise it, but it's there if you want it. Um, so the philosophy has been for the last 40 years is that we have to take the pathogens out the hands of the consumer. That's what we've been having HACCP for, this is what we're intervening. But we haven't been too successful with salmonella. So the real causes why people get compiled back from salmonella from chicken is because one, we temperature abuse it. We store it at inappropriate temperatures. Uh, that's more to do with Clostridium, Perfringens and Staph aureus. Cross-contamination. Uh, when we're in the kitchen, uh, we tend to use the same cutting board for everything. I'm pretty sure there's some good people here who's got different coloured boards for the raw and cooked. Uh, maybe not, uh, but uh, <laughs> typically uh, that's what you would do. You'd do sanitation and in inadequate cooking. Like, well, I'll do a straw poll because uh, how many people use a thermometer here? Wow, there's only three. Well, you're good. Good on you. <laughs> but most of us don't, do we? We always look at the colour. And the colour doesn't give you any indication at all. Well, a light, slight indication. And it was interesting, there was a uh, paper published by Ben Chapman, 
Ben used to be here as a, um, a PhD student. I think he went to North Carolina uh, to do food safety outreach. And he did a study on cookbooks. And he looked at the violations in terms of dangerous practices, not giving cooking temperatures. And he published a, a paper on it. And poor Gwyneth Paltrow, she got uh, the sort of brunt end of it. Uh, well, she's got a few sort of strange uh, ideas about food. And so really what they were suggesting is that cookbooks should have food safety advice. But I always say, you know, um, if we write papers, we're not going to put a recipe for Coco Van or things like that. But what it's really saying is that we have to take the uh, pathogens out of the poultry in order to, because consumers are going to do what consumers do regardless. So just uh, if I went through every sort of outbreak, um, you know, I think it would be all afternoon. But uh, this was an interesting case uh, down in the US. Uh, it was in Thanksgiving last year. And what this was is a uh, Thanksgiving dinner for veterans. So about, I think it was about 500, 600 people attended. And the thing was, is that they didn't uh, chill, uh, didn't serve things hot or they didn't serve things chilled. It was room temperature. And there was three people from the same sort of care home who attended this dinner and a few hours later they were dead. They were dead by Clostridium perfringens, which was very strange. But what this illustrates is even when you've cooked poultry, you do not inactivate Clostridium perfringens, and if you temperature abuse it, the potential is there to grow. So a very strange sort of outbreak because typically with Clostridium perfringens, a lot more people would be affected because they're eating the same sort of products and things like that. But uh, I could give you a few more sort of outbreaks in the UK, for example, where uh, El these elderly dinners at Christmas dinner, same scenario, temperature abuse of the chicken and Clostridium perfringens uh, being the cause. Now, the, one of the key parts of um, the sort of cases we see, though, is undercooking. As we've looked at, very few of us use a, a thermometer, um, especially in barbecue season when you just uh, usually fry the outside and uh, the poor centres are going to be raw. And there was an interesting outbreak a few years ago with these uh, what we call breaded entries. So with these entries, uh, they're partially cooked, not fully cooked, and you have to finish off the cooking yourself. And on this occasion, we were getting numerous sort of uh, cases of salmonella being reported. Even though on the packet it says cooked to this temperature, uh, people were ignoring it. <coughs> and the other sort of aspect of it was that uh, nowadays the only oven people have are microwaves and if you microwave you don't get homogeneous heating you get cold spots and so even though it was a raw product they had to recall this product they had not only recall it in the US they had to recall it in uh, Canada as well so this really made big confusion because the industry said look um, this is gonna, this has to be cooked but the CFAA a USDA had nothing of it. They said, no, you've got to recall that product. So you have to make sure the salmonella is uh, removed or the compiler back to this is reduced. And when you go into the uh, shops now and you'll see these products, you'll see you know, raw product cooked till this temperature because they're so obsessed with that. But you know, it's labeling the answer is the question. And the last one I'm going to talk about is salmonella Heidelberg. Now, salmonella in poultry is not zero tolerance. You know, essentially, um, E. coli, 0157 in ground beef is zero tolerance, but not salmonella in poultry. And in this occasion, this salmonella Heidelberg strain, which was very highly virulent, multidrug resistant, um, got into the system. And uh, there was two companies involved, Tyson Foods, which you might know about, and Foster Farms. Foster Farms is a nice, warm, cozy company like Maple Leaf are. Now, the thing was, is that the USDA and the CDC said, you've got to recall this uh, sort of ground beef. Over 800 people have got sick by it. Foster Farm says, no, it's not zero tolerance. Uh, we don't need to recall it. Now, they did eventually recall it because they got pest infestation, so they did it that way. But Tyson did the right thing and recalled the meat. So the reason why I'm talking about this is that there was a move, and there still is a move, to make zero tolerance for salmonella in poultry. And the industry said, we can't do that, you know, it's impossible to achieve. But they said, well, what about these uh, highly virulent strains we've come across? So these were going to be put onto a list. And this list was going to be uh, passed into regulation. But then they said, well, we've got no diagnostic tools to say 
this particular strain of uh, Heidelberg is going to be super virulent. So it just like fades into the distance. But the thing about the US system, enough people talk, enough people raise issues, then it becomes regulation. So it's the way it is. So the question is, isn't it, is can, can we achieve zero tolerance? So can we achieve um, poultry with no salmonella or compilobacter? And the answer is yes, we can. And the Danish have been fairly successful in doing that. Some people dispute that. So they've got very rigorous systems there. But in North America, we've got very different systems in terms of centralization, intensified production. Uh, the bottom line, you know, any intervention costs money. Uh, we have got this reliance on antimicrobials, and I'm pretty sure there's people here greater than I am who can talk about that and this sort of move towards ant uh, antibiotic-free uh, poultry. All the fast food chains are involved, A&M and uh, uh, McDonald's and things like that. You know, when you ask consumers, though, what do you expect from, you know, antibiotic-free poultry? They say, we don't know. It just sounds good, which is interesting. But anyway, to the point is that the industry also want to get rid of antibiotics because they're just not effective anymore. And as I say, there's this reluctance, and anybody from industry uh, listening, uh, I'll apologise to start with, a reluctant uh, willingness to adopt new things like vaccinations and things like that. So you've got a barrier, but the barriers are coming down because of changing regulations. So to tackle the salmonella issue and compilobacter issue, mainly salmonella, the USDA has to come up with a plan. Like, they came up with a plan in 1996, the white paper from Clinton, uh, that didn't work. So they came up with a new plan, and this is a salmonella action plan, which you can find online. Now, it contains other things other than poultry. It talks about uh, pork and it talks about beef, but mainly salmonella or poultry, as you can imagine, due to the fact it's got such a high cause rate. So they came up with this plan, which contains a lot of different sort of aspects from intervention controls through the way poultry is inspected, the way feed's inspected. And I had this sort of um, notion that they could, in, by 2020, as in three years' time, uh, have a 25% reduction in salmonella cases. Now, as you can see on the, the graph here, um, the plan was implemented in 2010 and they haven't got off to the best start, as in the case have actually increased. And, those cases increasing isn't so much the number of cases, which it could be, it's our detection methods have got much more sensitive. Much, and as I mentioned now, we actually use culture-free uh, techniques, which are sent, or culture-independent techniques, which means our positives are going to increase more. So their sort of notion about, and it's interesting, they never did publish a graph after this one to show the progress. Uh, they're not doing so well, but I suppose you've got to do something. We'll get to the, the important point. So as part of the action plan, they looked at this, what we call HIMP. So this HIMP is the HACCP Inspection Models Project. And you know, to condense it into simple speech, essentially what it's saying is that the staff at the slaughterhouse are now responsible for inspection. The federal inspectors step back, sit in the office, so might go onto the line just to make sure they're doing the good job and that's uh, how they're going to inspect for things like faecal matter and things like that, or diseased animals. So typically, um, the inspectors have thought back about this because it's their jobs. It's the FDA way of um, just, uh, or the USDA way of uh, reducing frontline inspectors, and there was protests and strikes and big concerns raised. So can the sort of plant personnel be trusted, relied upon in order to uh, inspect the poultry. And the other sort of aspect of it is that uh, obviously the processor has to pay these people to look at the poultry, so they permitted faster line speeds. Faster line speeds being maybe you know, much more uh, sort of difficulty in ensuring safety, as we'll talk about. So the other sort of aspect they looked at in the Salmonella Action Plan is about the uh, poultry slaughter rule. And uh, basically this rule was rewritten uh, before you could use E. coli and the, and the like. But what they do now is that they expect you to do sampling at pre and post chill. In addition to that, they expect you to come up with your own sampling plan and target, which is usually Enterobacteriaceae. But importantly to the talk, and I'm getting to the point uh, before everyone goes out, uh, it's the permitted use of a more extended range of sanitizers. So before, all you could use is chlorine. 
and we'll talk a bit about chlorine in a little bit. But now they've opened the sort of door to extended number of uh, interventions and also an extended um, list of sanitizers that can be used. And also what they've thrown in is the sampling of carcass parts, you know, breast legs. And the reason for that is because uh, once the poultry has left the line and gone to uh, breakdown, is that that's when the salmonella levels go really high. So essentially they've given the challenge to the industry to reduce the salmonella carriage you know, through any means that they deem possible and they'll make sure everything's safe, but it's up to the industry to act. No one's going to tell them what to do. So in terms of verification, this is essentially saying is your, salmon, uh, your system working to reduce salmonella? What's happened over the years is it's got much more stringent in terms of the number of positives allowed. And typically what you do in a typical veri verification is that you'll take um, samples uh, over 51 weeks, so one a week, uh, a rolling window. And if you've got more than 13 positive salmonella, you're essentially out of compliance. So out of compliance is not a good place to be because they'll say you've got to review your system, you've got to change the system, and then we're going to come back later to make sure you've done it. And if you fail a second time, uh, then you're on the line on the third time your plant's closed. So the big incentive now for the industry to actually take uh, hold of a problem and do something about it. So to sum up in terms of the summer performance standards, obviously it depends if you're doing turkeys or chickens and things like that. These are fairly stringent standards uh, to hold. And so for the sort of chicken parts, that say that was introduced uh, just recently, uh, you're not allowed many positives in order to be out of compliance. And as I say, if you're out of compliance, you get put into a category. And I won't expect you to read all this, but category one is where you want to be. This is where you're in full compliance um, and everything's working well. Now, category two is when your system isn't totally in control. Uh, you are meeting the standard most of the time, but you're out of compliance uh, some of the time when you take this moving window into account. But in category three, you're basically out of compliance. And there's talk, and I don't know if uh, they've went ahead with it, is they'll advertise your, your business name on the website to say, this uh, outlet, this sort of house is in category three, which doesn't go down well with consumers. It doesn't go down well with uh, people like Costco and people you're, you're selling to. So there's a lot of incentive. So get to uh, the point, I'm running out of time already, but to get to the point is that how do we meet this standard? Well, obviously, what we, the easiest thing, isn't it, is to rely on the vets um, and people and animal pathologists. They can go onto the farm and eradicate all salmonella and compile it back to and the world will be good, wouldn't it? Very difficult to do, um, as uh, you probably all attest to. So the other thing we can do is apply interventions within the processing line itself and sanitation, which is uh, going to be important. I'm not going to talk too much about shelf life, but I've got an example where we did look at sanitation shelf life where it becomes significant. So it sounds easy to do, but when you're processing 70 birds a minute, going up to 140 birds a minute, that's when it comes challenging, isn't it? So on the farm level then, uh, you know, the notion, you know, the one health approach would suggest that we could eradicate salmonella um, at the farm level. And, you know, you, you're bigger experts than me about how you've tried to do that. But the reality is we haven't made much of a dent and we're getting new salmonellas come in, like the salmonella Kentucky was talking about, uh, which is significant. The compiler back to have decreased, but, you know, it's unacceptably high still. And I don't need to tell you about the challenges of trying to tackle pathogens at the farm level. Not easy. So let's go with our philosophy we've had for 40 years and handle it at the processing level. So what we can do then, once I've left the farm, you know, that's where our sort of problems really start occurring fairly early on. Um, they're packed into crates. Obviously, this causes stress. Distance causes stress, uh, heat stress. And this causes increased shedding of salmonella. Increases the fecal excretion. Those clumps get onto the feathers. And that has to be removed somehow. And we'll talk about how that leads on to something else later on. Um, the sanitary status of crates is another issue. You know, how good is it? We've, we did a project on uh, crates in uh, the fresh produce area and also partly on meat. And 
the standards they have as pr practically zero in terms of standards, and the methods they use to sanitize them between uh, batches isn't good enough. That goes for fresh produce and for poultry as well. So we'll get to the poultry plant then. Usually the holding period is very small, usually straight off the uh, lorry, straight onto the line. And this is a typical sort of slaughter process. Uh, I don't know if you, you've probably all seen it in one vice or another. <laughs> so the birds are hung up. Uh, they go through electrocution bath. They get the throats cut. Uh, if they survive the throat cutting, which can happen, there's estimated one million birds a year who miss the execution, the electrocution or the throat cutting part, should I say. And people are worried that these li high line speeds actually will increase that number. So that's important from an animal welfare point of view, as you can imagine. So if you survive that, you get uh, into the skull tank. The skull tank's there to loosen the feathers, uh, reduce the uh, contamination people suggest, but in reality, what you're hoping for is just to reduce cross-contamination. You're not looking for a decrease, you're looking for uh, just making the situation uh, not as bad. Then it goes into a defeverer. The defeverer, as the name suggests, uh, removes the feathers. Then it goes to the evisceration line, uh, then onto the chill tanks. And as we'll talk about, each of these processes is significant. You cannot just choose one sort of process and focus on that. All the significance, as we'll see. All right, so I'll give you the punchline before we start, is that really, at the end of the day, if you're bringing in poultry which has got high salmonella, high compalobacter, you're going to have a very tough job in terms of reducing it. But the critical steps, and it's not so much critical steps in terms of reducing salmonella, it's preventing cross-contamination. And that depends on the scalding tank, as we'll talk about, the evisceration, the chilling tanks. And what people fall into is saying, look, we'll just add chlorine to this tank, or we'll just add peroxyacetic acid. Even though that water is probably thick with fecal material, you know, it doesn't work like that. So, and I know, industry, I know certain industry people who do think it works like that, but it doesn't. Your water quality is key, and this is where people make the big mistake. And the reason why we make the big mistake is that water is expensive, not only to buy, but to dispose of as well. So people like this water management, use as less water as possible, but that's going to have consequences, as we'll see. So in the scalding tank, um, as you could imagine, it's uh, just basically a bath of hot water to loosen the feathers. But the lower amount of faecal material or organic you can get into that uh, scalding tank, the better it is, because you've got uh, less sort of uh, pathogens there. Use counterflow water, as in fresh water at the start, uh, water removal at the end. And the scalding temperature is important as well. So you can go for a soft scald, which is about 50 degrees C, and then the hard scald, which is a bit higher at uh, 60 degrees C. And your instincts say to you, saying, well, higher the temperatures are better, isn't it? Because we can kill off salmonella and compilobacter and be good with that. But the thing is that loosens the fat, liquefies the fat, which then becomes a problem in your chill tank. So you've got this connection going on. And, you know, the accumulation of matter, you could imagine it. So 70 birds going into that uh, skull tank a minute, it accumulates. And this is where the water quality is key. If you haven't got uh, clean water in that skull tank, it doesn't matter what sanitizer you use. So what the industry is going towards is water recycling. So with water recycling, and this is uh, true for the produce industry, it's a key part which people are starting to realize. And the average sort of typical scald water temp, uh, sort of characteristics is a very high biological oxygen demand, BOD. Uh, total soluble solids is high, ammonia quite high, and nitrogen, but the turbidity, of, as you can imagine, is, uh, is fairly high as well. So what you have to do is clean that water up in order to make your sanitizers work. And I won't go through it now, but our separate line of research is going through these different uh, water treatment technologies. One of the most effective ones is this diffuse air flotation reactor, uh, which is compact and effective. And essentially what happens is you bring the, the spent water in, you put a coagulating agent in, alum or something like that. You get this jacuzzi kind of uh, apparatus there, which uh, basically blows, uh, infuses the sort of flocculent uh, to float to the surface, or the heavier debris uh, sink to the bottom. Usually it floats to the top and it's scraped off. 
So just that process, uh, it does cost a bit, admittedly, uh, 500,000 for a uh, one system, but it reduces that BOD and that COD significantly. So your sanitizers get a chance to work. Uh, another process we're looking at is electrocoagulation. And uh, with electrocoagulation, essentially what you're doing, you've got these aluminium electrodes, which uh, you know, essentially are sacrificial. They throw out alum, you get sodium hydroxide produced at the cathode, and you get alum hydroxide, which forms a coagulant. You get hydrogen gas produced, floats to the top, heavy debris sinks to the bottom, and you even get slight disinfection with it. So again, a compact system. You're not looking at waste, wa growth waste waterworks here. A compact system you cut up on in, within the plant in order to treat the water. So in terms of sanitizers then, the sort of mainstay has been chlorine. And you go to Europe and you say, we're going to put chlorine in our wash tanks and skull tanks. They will up in arms. They will not accept any sort of uh, poultry that's been treated with chlorine. And this goes to the European philosophy. The European philosophy is that they're obsessed with carcinogens, they're obsessed with pesticides, they're obsessed with chemical contaminants, whereas in North America we're obsessed with uh, bacterial uh, contaminants and pathogens. So in Europe they don't want it. So, you know, people in the US have said, you know, it's only a small amount of disinfection byproducts, you know, you get formed chloroform and things like that, uh, which is true. But the reality is, you put chlorine in there, it's going to have no effect whatsoever. It's going to be sequestered by the organics, so add it if you, it makes you feel better sort of thing, isn't it? So what people have done is, they start, because of this new rule, we can expand on the number of sanitizers. Peroxy acetic acid has become popular, fairly uh, insensitive to organics and phosphoric acid and sodium hydroxide. But as I mentioned to you, they only work with low organics. Um, and the chief um, sort of role of, is to reduce the cross-contamination events. So typically then, uh, with this is a sodium hydroxide, a soft uh, skull, the lower temperature with sodium hydroxide in to get the pH to alkali. Yeah, you get a, a reduction of uh, salmonella. The hard scold, you know, the higher temperature, you get a, an increased uh, decrease. But as I said, you've got to be careful because the loosened fat can cause problems downstream. So with a scalding process, as I said, it's not reducing salmonella. What you're hoping for is you don't cross-contaminate, you don't make the problem much worse. So this is why it has to be controlled. So we come to the defeathering then. The defeathering, as I said, is this sort of uh, car wash effect with the brushes. And typically what happens, the, uh, the poultry go in there, the, the, the feathers are ripped from them. And as you can imagine, the pressing action causes fecal material to come out. You go onto the brushes, it contaminates a whole batch of uh, carcasses, doesn't it? So you can try to exercise control there. Uh, to reduce the cross-contamination. You can do that by various means, electro-stimulation to reduce the uh, sort of fecal carriage they're doing outside the uh, brushes rather than inside the, the thing. But at the end of the day, the key point is evis evisceration. So evisceration, uh, the common, most common source of salmonella compilobacter comes from the GI tract, and they've got better equipment to do that now, but you know, feed withdrawal, things like that, are also significant, because if you've got a full crop, it just goes everywhere, doesn't it? Now we come to the chill tank, where most people think, well, this is where the action is. This is where we can start reducing salmonella. And the answer is, no, it's not. Uh, chill tanks, a bit like skull tanks, uh, get really clogged up very quickly with organics. And as we talked about organics, uh, sequesters, uh, sanitizers, the fat layer, which you've, you've loosened off because you scold it too much, forms a protective <coughs> layer for the salmonella to reside in, and you'll get bigger problems. So you can uh, certainly go in uh, with a, a low salmonella and come out the other end with a high salmonella. Now, the thing is with the chill tanks, the main purpose of them is just to cool the poultry down. It's not to do with disinfection. But, you know, this doesn't stop people saying, well, look, I'll sell you some uh, sanitizer, I'll sell you chlorine, I'll sell you proxy acetic acid. Bromine, much less sensitive to organics and the lactic acids and things like that. And you go to uh, published websites, even papers, they'll say five log reduction, no issue there. But the trouble is, these trials, which say five log reduction are done in the lab, doesn't even recreate what goes on in the commercial processing. If you look into the literature, 
when commercial, those trials done in commercial processing, you might get a log reduction, if you're lucky. Uh, more likely, you'll see an increase in the salmonella carriage. And so it's not uncommon to have uh, an increase up to 50% positives of salmonella coming out of the wash tanks. And I know I'll go on about it. You know, essentially accumulation of organics with sequestering of uh, sanitizers. And again, water quality is the key. If you invest in uh, wastewater treatment, you're going to save yourself a lot of uh, pain. Now, after the chilling pros, the chill tanks, then we come to the antimicrobial step. This antimicrobial step, uh, thankfully, most of your organics have been left behind in the chill tanks. And there's different philosophies you can follow here. You can have dips, uh, you know, basically sanitizer dips. Some people prefer them. You can see the advantages of them, more compatible with high throughput. You have uh, sprays, uh, which are less prone to cross-contamination. And you get the sort of uh, air treatments, the gas treatments, based on things like ozone and things like that. So this is a step where we try to reduce the uh, pathogen prevalence. And again, there's been a lot of different sanitizers proposed. Peroxyacetic acid is becoming the favorite one because it's uh, fairly stable. Chlorine, people are going against chlorine because even with chlorine, once it hits the poultry, it just sequesters. Acidified sodium chloride is more stable, more oxidizing, so that's become popular. People's tried ozone doesn't work so well. And the sort of pH regulators, the acid and the uh, phosphate. So typically in a spray situation then, uh, what people have found, and I say you just always take it with a pinch of salt, but you get a, a, quite a good log reduction with chlorine, uh, acidified sodium chloride, peroxyacetic acid, and the trisodium phosphate, but they're not really big reductions, uh, which is typical. So it's not a, you can't rely on it as the only sort of intervention. Now, there's been a lot of talk about air chilling, and the reason why people like air chilling is, one, it doesn't use water, so that's a good thing, we're going to save money there. Um, but the reality is it, that it's a potential for cross-contamination through airborne contamination, passing from one carcass to the next. And ozone gas, about 20 years ago, there was a study released in the UK that was really promoting ozone gas treatment, saying, you know, this is what we need to do, a substitute. But when people try to repeat that, uh, as many experiments do, um, they didn't really find it worked very well at all. You got a one log reduction for the simple reason of the challenges. You know, basically, uh, chicken skin is not easy. It's got follicles on, it's got crevices, and also it's very sensitive to uh, discoloration and things like that. So all in all, then, what we're saying is that it's not one particular step that you can use to reduce pathogens, but a combination. And so by taking samples at different parts, and the OLR is the um, reprocessing, online reprocessing when you've got fecal material on the carcass, you know, you can look at the prevalence of salmonella and identify where you're going wrong. And what you want to do, isn't it, is optimize each of those processes in order to reduce cross-contamination, reduce salmonella, and at the end of the day, you can meet those sort of uh, targets that uh, were put on. So the thing is, though, it's all about having intervention, but sanitation is critical as well. So sanitation in uh, processing plants is challenging because the equipment's old. Um, basically, it's not sanitary design. But we were involved in a project which was looking at uh, premature spoilage of chicken wings. And basically what was happening is that they were putting them on the shelf and about two days later they were spoiled. And we had to tr sort of investigate it. So as um, good experiment, well, good or bad experiments are, we looked at the microflora and we looked at the counts. So we, we noticed there was high yeast counts for a starters, which isn't a good sign because that's usually an indicator of poor sanitation and fairly high pseudomonas counts as well. And so what we also did is uh, we looked at what type of yeast were there. And what we found was that there was a very pr highly protolytic yeast, candida. And this candida tends to accumulate under poor sanitary conditions. So it's an indicator. But what we did find as well is that we needed this yeast to be there in order to launch the cascade, which would encourage the bacterial spoilage. So we advised the uh, company to uh, go hunting for this uh, yeast to try and find its niches so they could tackle that and hopefully their sort of uh, shelf life would increase. And we also did um, 
the sequencing, next generation sequencing. The writing's too small here, I should have made it more reader friendly. But essentially what he was saying is the Pseudomonas, Acrobacter, they're the sort of two spoilage organisms. And the power of this technique is that if you identify which are the causative organisms, you can then go hunting for them. What are the niches? Are they coming in from the raw uh, material, as in the birds? Is it in the scalding tank? Is it in the brushing? So it's a very powerful technique in that respect. So what people are looking for to meet these standards is alternatives to just uh, chill tanks and things like that. And you know, people's experimenting with lots of different things like hot water and steam, very expensive, and you're heating it up to cool it down, which doesn't make that much sense. And they've used organic acids, which we've just talked about, the lactic acids, and other sort of combinations of acids. But the one we've tried um, is the advanced oxidative process, which I'll refer to. We've just got time. And uh, you know, people have always uh, looked at bacteriophages, or not look, always, but looked at bacteriophages as well as certain treatments. And even though irradiation has been allowed for poultry for a number of years now, not many companies do it because consumers don't like it. Uh, if consumers don't like it, retailers don't like it, which basically means not many people utilise it. So when you're getting an alternative method to decontaminate car uh, poultry carcasses, you've got a lot of challenges. One is that you've got crevices and follicles which provide protective sites, but it's so sensitive to discoloration, so sensitive to rancidity and drip loss. So you can read all these papers that are published about Oh, we've got a five log reduction of Salmonella and Compilobacter. But you say, well, what was the century analysis? And they, oh, we didn't do century analysis. So you'll see, you say you can achieve this, but you have to put in the century analysis as well in, in order to prevent um, any sort of issues. So as I mentioned, and some of the audience today work on bacteriophages, they would say, you know, we don't have to worry about chemical sanitizers. We can just have bacteriophages, the viruses that infect uh, the pathogen and it'll cure everything. Well, the reality is bacteriophages are very expensive for a start, very difficult to apply, and at the end of the day, they're as good as chemical sanitizers anyway. Um, and chemical sanitizers have the added advantage of having a broader host range, isn't it? So bacteriophages, there'll be work uh, going on, I'm sure, but as a solution, one would question it. So what we've done, and this is our part of poultry research, uh, which I had to scrap together, is um, an advanced oxidative process. So advanced oxidative process is where we basically generate free radicals. And these free radicals can be generated from the breakdown of ozone, breakdown of hydrogen peroxide. Even putting hydrogen peroxide and ozone together to generate these uh, free radicals which are antimicrobial, and you can do it in vapor phase or you can do it in, uh, as a dip, whichever you prefer. So this is the equipment we have, like we used to use it for apples, uh, but you know, poultry is as good as anything. It's got UV lamps here, it's got an ozone generating lamp as well. Uh, you just put your, uh, and it's the vapour of hydrogen peroxide is introduced um, via vaporizer. And what we found when we, we tried this treatment, you might recall uh, sanitizers give about one to two log reduction. We're getting very good uh, reductions of uh, salmonella and uh, that yeast, the candida yeast, because this is really what it was to try and uh, reduce the spoilage and things like that. So it's dependent on the hydrogen peroxide concentration, treatment time, and, but it's an effective treatment, an alternative treatment. Now the trouble with this sort of uh, tunnels is that uh, we needed about 60 seconds to do the treatment. And 60 seconds, that's 35 birds that have just gone past. So essentially we uh, looked at a different system which was basically putting ozone peroxide together. A very simple solution, but it's much more effective compared to just uh, typical sanitizers. And importantly, not only does it reduce things like yeast and the salmonella, it uh, maintains the quality of the raw product. As I mentioned, a lot of studies uh, out there will tell you we get a five log reduction, but uh, typically you've got to make the product look raw still. So to finish off, um, I've gone rushed through it a bit, but uh, to finish off, at the end of the day, you know, we can do so much, can't we? We can get, like Walmart claim, for example, have got the salmonella carriage down by two, up to 2% uh, now, or down to 2%, should I say. Very good. 
But um, you know, even that's quite high when you think about so the amount of poultry that's sold and things like that. So we have to do consumer education. We have to get more people to use uh, different coloured cutting boards. Definitely, obviously, the uh, more people to use uh, temperature probes and things like that. And how do you do that? Like if uh, consumers, you go out to a consumer and say, I think you should fire a thermometer, they'll probably ignore you for one thing. And you know, this sort of notion that you can put food safety <laughs> advice in cookbooks, I don't think people buy cookbooks for food safety advice. But a very good campaign that was launched in the UK um, a few years ago was this sort of uh, blitz, a media blitz. So it wasn't a pamphlet, it wasn't just a tweet or a Facebook posting, they did everything. They mobilised the whole public health units, they went on TV, they went on Facebook, they went on Twitter, and they got 20 million hits. And not only that, but people were actually reporting here in Canada, uh, on the news here, uh, one occasion it wasn't on the news, I guess. But the, po the point was, if you're going to do something, do it big time. Now, whether it, all I was saying in this message is do not wash your chicken. Like, if you go to your grandma's and that, they say, oh yes, wash your chicken, it's all right. But that spreads contamination. But this simple message wanted just a single message, say, don't wash your chicken, and they got really big uh, throughputs. Now, whether that changed behaviour is something else, isn't it? But certainly, uh, thermometers are always good to have. Uh, don't microwave your poultry is another good bit of advice. All right, so uh, a bit of a whirlwind tour, but in conclusion then, I think we all know that Salmon and compiler bacteria are significant in terms of uh, carriage and poultry is a significant vehicle for that. And you know, whilst we're trying to control things on the farm, uh, obviously there's a lot of things we can do in the processing plant, but there's no magic bullet. It's a case of a combination of approaches. And even though water quality recycling systems might not be their sort of top priority, there's a very good reason why it should be their top priority. Sanitizers come, but you can't sanitize uh, water that's loaded with organics and things like that. The good thing about the regulations is that uh, with the interventions are more flexible, we can see new technologies coming through, uh, but they have to accept a few things, isn't it? One, the high line speeds, and two, <coughs> is the cost of the uh, material, the, the cost of implementing and obviously the century quality of the product. You know, people still expect to see raw poultry. And sanitation, you know, better sanitation design, better sanitation regimes, antimicrobial coatings are coming up. There was just a report yesterday where the first commercial coating has been launched uh, based on this sort of surface topography, which prevents bacteria binding. Um, now, many would say, well, it stops it binding there, it just displaces it. But these are the sort of interventions, novelty that people have to do. So in terms of acknowledgements, obviously uh, the people who fund us are always uh, good to mention, uh, MAFRA and NSERC and the OCE. Um, Hamid Salsali uh, from Environmental Power, and I can't mention the poultry processors, uh, we'll probably get litigated into Stone Age. But the people who actually do the work is uh, Fan, who's sitting here, Ayman, who was from Egypt, uh, Chelsea's not here, but Kayla's not here, Hui Hui, who's... Um, you know, she, I've never seen anyone eat so much at a uh, buffet before, but you know, these are the people who actually did the work and we appreciate them for their efforts. So with that, I'll thank you and uh, I'll try and answer any questions you may have. Thanks very much, Keith. Any questions for Dr. Warren? Uh, I, I can ask you a question. Is it about organics? Organic production. <coughs> oh, right. I was just going to ask you maybe a, a rather convoluted question. So, keep, you know, we talked about uh, using probiotics for finding out salmonella and Campylobacter in chickens. But is it possible that you create some kind of food microbiome that you can spray on the food, and you know, those bacteria would fight up salmonella and Campylobacter while you know the chicken is going through the process of you know scalding and chilling, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or while it's sitting you know on the shelf. No, and that's a very interesting question, isn't it? Because there's this thought about, well, we're going to have microflora in chickens. Just make sure it's the microflora we want, isn't it? And there have been efforts, uh, certainly, where they've uh, done that. They've tried to alter the microflora to suppress spoilage organisms and pathogens. But the, at the end of the day, 
you know, I think it comes down to consumer acceptance. If you said you were going to spray your chicken with the, uh, the probiotics, which you know, could be anything um, uh, not nice like lactic acid bacteria, which spoil. So, in a lot of ways, the biocontrol, I think, does have a place, certainly, in certain uh, points in the process, uh, chill tanks being one, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I don't think it'll be consumer accepted. But on the farm level, obviously, probiotics have been tried to varying degrees, haven't they? Right. Yeah, I'll just add a, a quick, oh, sorry, yes. Yeah. Mind the question for the webinar? I will, uh, if I remember uh, I it rightly. So many of the sort of um, regulation or the sort of proposals I suggested about the HIM and uh, the sort of stringent standards, yes, some of them have actually become implemented as regulation. Now the HIMP is still going through the course, it's being fought by all sides, industry don't want it because they don't want to pay people to inspect it, inspectors don't want it because they'll be out of a job. So, but that's going to go through. Uh, but certainly the, uh, pol the action plan in terms of sanitizers, in terms of interventions, that is regulation. And when we say regulation, it gives much more freedom to choose which ones. Now, the sort of hurdle there is that if you want to say, I'm going to use this sanitizer on poultry, you have to go through the toxicology and everything. So people are a bit reluctant to do that. But uh, certainly what uh, we're getting to the point of is that it'll get more stringent, so processes, and it's not regulation as such. You know, essentially what the government are doing is saying, look, it's your problem, you solve it, and we're just here to check that you do solve it. But there's a lot of flexibility there, but in terms of regulation, there's this uh, stepping back kind of thing, but a lot of the things are talked about is actually regulation now. Oh, yes. Uh, how do you mention in your lecture about the differences between the uh, chilling tank and air chilling, but if a producer want to ask a simple question, if they dealing with the chilling tank and they wanted to uh, spend the money in that, doing this investment to change it to the air chiller, in some countries they are doing that, mm -hmm. is it a big difference or you can recommend keeping that chilling tank and doing more advanced things instead of just spending money to, for air chilling? Uh, no, and that's a very good point. Yes, I can. Yes. It's all right. I don't, I don't know the routine. Um, so the question is, is that there's been a big interest in air chilling, and would it be worth the investment to go from air chilling um, as a technology? Um, well, the first question, well, the first part of the question, the chill tanks uh, we mentioned is really to reduce the temperature. It's not an antimicrobial step. Where the choices come in is in the Finnish chillers. And as I mentioned, uh, 20 years ago, there was research where everybody was going to chill, air chill for the simple reason that uh, this report say was more effective. But the reality is, is that it's, got, uh, it's not effective. And you know, previously, you could say, well, look, it's all about show. It's all about saying, look, we're washing, we're air chilling. Uh, we don't have to prove it. But now the stringent standards have come in. You've got to meet those standards. And air chilling is not one way of achieving them. Uh, certainly spraying is much more controlled, which uh, people are tending to go towards now. But the main problem with the poultry industry, as I uh, referred to, is the fact that it's old, sometimes it's old infrastructure. It needs a lot of investment. Um, that's coming through, but uh, it is a difficult decision. But I always say to industry, because uh, they're the ones who have to implement this, is if you are going to do anything differently, you've got to look at the evidence for it not take uh, just the word for it because uh, a lot of researchers, shall we say, promote their technologies without taking into account commercial processing demands. So typically then, yeah, it's a big investment and uh, would I invest in it? I don't think I would do a uh, set of air chilling. But these sort of processes which we refer to, such as advanced oxidative process, um, which is fairly cost effective, compatible with light speed is another issue, but you've got to think outside the box, you know, um, but, and I'll say, it, I'll say it again, if I was going to invest in infrastructure, it would be for water treatment, you know, it's what people uh, should be doing. Well, we'll talk about my organics if there's one minute left. <laughs> 
So one of the challenges that you that can have is with organic processes. Organic processes aren't allowed to use sanitizers, they're very restricted to what they can do. And although people enjoy organic uh, poultry in terms of uh, div uh, premiums and things like that, that's going to be a big challenge. And how you achieve that challenge is going to be very difficult due to the restrictions you have. Um, and it, it won't surprise me um, if more evidence comes, you know, it'll be interesting to see how the consumer behaves when they see organic material or organic poultry and consider food safety rather than the sort of lifestyle they have. But that'll be interesting to see how that develops, but it's challenging. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Please join me to thank Dr. Warner for the wonderful presentation. And I have one housekeeping item, you know, before we adjourn. So please join me to thank <laughs> item is that this is our concluding uh, seminar for uh, the season. We are going to be uh, taking some time off over summer and we are going to be starting in September again. So you're going to see us back in, in uh, the, the normal cycle as of I would imagine probably second or third week of September. Right, Daddy? Okay, thank you very much everyone. And yeah, enjoy your summer. Time. Yeah, enjoy your summer.